Right, it's 14 minutes past eight. You're very welcome back to OTBAM. It's time for us to turn to rugby. It is the first of three tests on Saturday morning. Obviously, Ireland are playing the uh, New Zealand Maoris tomorrow morning. And I'm delighted to say Matt Williams and Gregor Paul are with us to help preview the game. Gregor, I might start with you. Um, a bit of a, a mini bombshell uh, broke overnight last night when it turned out that Joe Schmidt is actually going to be actively part of the coaching ticket for this week. Uh, this is some some might say Ireland's worst nightmare, where you know Joe, who was our beloved son, suddenly is plotting our downfall. Was this always was this always secretly part of New Zealand's master tactical plan to derail Ireland in this summer test? And COVID's just a flimsy excuse so they can shoehorn him to the coaching ticket. Uh, not not really, but I think it would be naive to believe that Joe hasn't been pretty heavily involved. Um, up until this point anyway. I know he officially wasn't going to start until um, after the Irish series was out of the way. But look, I think he's had a pretty healthy input uh, prior to um, being officially called in. COVID has enabled him to now come in you know, on an emergency ticket, if you like, and, and eased his conscience a wee bit because he felt a wee bit uncomfortable um, given his relationship with Ireland and his history there. He didn't you know, that, that's why he was actually delaying his arrival until after the series was out of the way. But he's now he's now here and he's a legitimate reason for being involved. And uh, look, I, I think Joe Schmidt's input would have been pretty heavy whether he was officially here or not. What was he doing up to this point and, and what will his role be after this uh, emergency situation is resolved? Uh, up, up until this point, he's been working with the Blues. Uh, the Super Rugby team, the Blues, as a sort of, I'm not entirely sure what his official title there was, technical director, so whatever he felt like doing, I think that meant. Uh, I, think, I think he'll be with the team now for the duration of the series, and then when they go to South Africa, his official role is a selector slash analyst, but I think you could interpret that as selector slash assistant coach, probably. Okay, and is that also slash head coach in waiting or does Scott Robertson have still you know kind of a, hang on a second what what do I have to do here <laughs> well yeah Scott Robertson probably does wonder that look jo- Joe's coached at the international level hasn't it he's done it very well he's got a fantastic record with Ireland um the question I suppose with Joe is is he ready mentally lifestyle wise does he want to go back there because when he finished up with Ireland you'll know this way better than I would he, he was pretty drained, you know, it had a big mental toll on him. When he came back here, he didn't really have any desire to coach. He was quite happy down in Taupo, not part of proceedings, didn't want to didn't want to be involved. Uh, and, and he was asked, I mean, Ian Foster wanted him on his tick when he took, took the job in 2020, Joe, not for me, not for me. And then probably <laughs> beginning of last year, Foster started to really, you know, really push hard to persuade him to get involved. And Joe was reluctant, and he's eventually got to the point where he's happy to say, I'm happy to come in as an analyst and, and as a selector. But I think anyone that knows Joe will imagine that once he's in, to, to kind of only have one foot in there, I don't I don't see that being his long-term future. I think he probably, once he commits, he commits. And once he joins the All Blacks, I think he's the kind of character, and you, you guys would know more than I would here, whether he'd be happy long term being the assistant or in the background, it's a question of whether he's ready to put his hand up and, and put himself in the front line. Because if 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 he felt the pressure coaching Ireland, uh, you're in the wrong job if you're not up to dealing with pressure. Because being coach of the All Blacks, you know that, that, that's a that's a lot more pressure than comes with coaching Ireland. I think. And, and those fans of the All Blacks, Gregor, like did, did they look at Joe Schmidt as somebody who is a genius at a game and his, his record with? Ireland and with Leinster is, is so good that he can only contribute positive things to the team or is there some question marks maybe around Ireland's style of play and maybe it doesn't necessarily match up with the swashbuckling All Blacks way? Well, I, I think what he's bringing is something that the All Blacks need a wee bit of at the moment. So, you know, that, that swashbuckling, your word there, I like that, uh, style that the All Blacks have, that's probably always going to be inherently in the, in the DNA of the players because it's how they want to play. It's the type of athletes that they are. Where everyone's become a wee bit concerned about the All Blacks and where Ireland and South Africa have exploited them and England did it at the, uh, the World Cup it is around the kind of um, set-piece efficiency, the physicality that they bring over the breakdown. So, yeah, they've got all the skills in the world. and If you give them space and time, they'll, they'll pull any team apart. 
but there's a question mark now about whether they've got the nuts and bolts the kind of hardness the age the discipline to 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 stick to quite a rigid conservative game plan first to break teams down and then open them up and that's the kind of stuff that that south africa are doing really well ireland do it really well as well so new zealand need a wee bit of that and joe brings it you know he's got that kind of ability to to stick to a very disciplined simple game plan um so look i think everyone's going to welcome that and secondly what he also has is pretty good knowledge of how the northern hemisphere sides think and again that's proving to be a wee bit of an achilles heel for new zealand at the moment if we if we bracket south africa as a northern hemisphere side which they almost are then you know that uh south africa ireland france and england are the last four teams to have beaten the all blacks and there's a wee bit of a pattern developing there so they need to understand a wee bit about the threat that's coming at them and and, and joe gives them that matt williams what was your immediate response or, or take when you saw that Joe Schmidt is now part of this coaching ticket and, and you know, listening to um, to Gregor there talking about this, it, you know, you get the sense that there's a, a certain element of it being a drug coaching at that level and, you know, you, you, you can wean yourself off it, but when you're back on it, you're going to be back on it, uh, you know, pretty hardcore. And the New Zealand job is literally the best and most interesting job in world rugby. A lot, a, a lot there, Joe. Uh, a lot there, Joe. Um, the New Zealand job is the most prestigious job in, in world rugby, but Greg has hit the nail right on the head. It is the biggest pressure in the world as well. It's a very tough job. Look, I know Joe was really, really frazzled at the end of his time in Ireland, as any uh, human being would be. Why don't, uh, with the exception of Eddie Jones, and let's put him off as an exception, uh, mentally, he's an exceptional person. He is, we use the term workaholic. He is a workaholic. So let's put him to one side. When you're coaching at the top end, it smashes you um, emotionally. And you've got to learn to cope with that. And obviously, Joe has. It's whether you, but you, you, you decide you don't want that pressure anymore. That doesn't mean you don't love the game or you don't want to coach. Let, let, let's, let's look at Wayne Smith, the great Wayne Smith. Now, Wayne started coaching back with me in 90. I started in 97. Wayne came into, um, into coaching in, in 98. Now, Wayne has been head coach of a lot of places. He still loves the game and wants to be involved, but he doesn't want to be a head coach anymore because that brings with it a whole lot of extra stresses that your assistant coach does not have. And in many ways, being an assistant is the best gig in the world because what do you do? You just do all the things you love, which is the players, the game, the tactics. You don't have to worry too much about the media. You don't have to worry about selections, usually. You don't have to worry too much about, about what committees are saying and all that. That's the boss's job. So, so I think that Joe may very well, well, he is coming back into this role, and I think he may be very well happy to be second spear on the left where he doesn't have to worry and carry all that extra baggage. Greg is absolutely spot on. As soon as I heard Joe, this talk of Joe, I just thought, oh, the media are going to be all over this. Joe's obviously been involved for a long, long time in the preparation for this series. The series, you know, like in professional rugby, the coaches don't get together on Monday morning and say, oh, boys, we've got a game on Saturday. What, what are we doing? You know, we're we going to do this now? Like, they've been preparing for months and months for this uh, for this series because what's the information they've got on Ireland? They've only got the Six Nations. So they've gone back and they've based a lot of their analysis on what Ireland did during the Six Nations. They've obviously then, they, they say... Uh, and we know COVID's there. They war game, we we'll use that term war game, in other words, what if scenarios, what if Ireland lose Henderson, what they've done today, who are they going to put in? What if Sexton doesn't play, who are they going to put in? And they would have their plans prepared for all the Irish what ifs. Just as today, with Ian Foster and Johnny Plumtree down with COVID, they've war game that. They, they, you know, this whole group have, have been in Australia last year in a bubble through COVID. And they're saying, well, what if what happens if one of us gets it? What happens if two of us get it? What happens if the whole staff's out? What happens if our captain's out? They war game and they practice. Now, I can tell you, Foster and Johnny Plumtree are at home. They're away from the team. But they're obviously Skyping in each day. They'll be getting the video of training every day. That's all, Training at every professional rugby club is is uh, recorded and analysed and sent to them. And they'll be giving feedback to Mo, who I, I, I've read it is... Gregor would know more than me. I'm only reading reading what he's writing and other journalists from New Zealand are writing is the head coach. And Joe will be an incredibly important part of that preparation as a support. But to think that Joe 
turned up Monday morning and is going to change everything and every tactic that they practice is going to be all altered. I mean, that that is just, it's just madness. It's not the truth. The truth is he is part of a system now. He will enjoy it. But that system will have rolled on no matter if Ian Foster's there or not. And the talk is that Foster and Plumtree may, may be at the game. Uh, again, Gregor know more about that than me. Yeah, I, I think... Like I, I buy everything both of you are saying here. I think Gregor, it's particularly interesting. Like the the knock on Schmidt time in Ireland from some quarters was that we had become a little bit predictable because we were so focused on the set piece and so focused on the structure. Uh, and the point you make too about the New Zealand, the swashbuckling is going to be an eight because of the skill level of the players. It does for us. The, the terror is that actually he adds that structure, that skill that that skill set is there innately in the players and suddenly a new a new beast is unleashed on world rugby where they can do everything really well at a pace that nobody can live with yeah well that, that that's clearly their plan um and that, that's what they're aiming for they're aiming for exactly that that the, the you look at that back line and it's it's pretty impressive isn't it aaron smith Bowden barrett you know when they're all fit um, Rico Iwani, Caleb Clark, Will Jordan, who has been virtually untouchable in Super Rugby. So you're thinking, shit, you don't want these guys, if you're playing them, to be playing with space, with time. You don't want them to play off counter-attack if you're trying to defend them because they're instinctive, they're so quick, they're all so skilled. They got, they're going to rip a few teams apart. We all know that. They have done previously and they will do again. But where they've been a wee bit weak and when they've hit... You know, South Africa are brilliant at putting a brick wall up, aren't they? They they give nothing away. They 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 box kick, they turn you around, they scrummage you for penalties, they slow the game right down, and they and they frustrated New Zealand to the point where they've gone the front foot so hard that New Zealand haven't been able to throw anything at them in the last couple of times they've played. And Ireland have been reasonably similar in how they've shut them out of the game. So you know that's that's the turnaround point. For New Zealand, if get, and look, they're destined here. If we look at the World Cup, unless uh, unless my boys in Scotland can play the role of disruptor, then we're looking at a World Cup where New Zealand play one of either New, uh, South Africa or Ireland at the quarterfinal of the World Cup. And that's not so much at the back of the mind at the moment. That's actually at the forefront of the mind for for these guys because if New Zealand can't um, prove in the next five Test matches. That they've got a game plan that can they can flourish against these two teams, then I think we're going to be on the well, I wouldn't say definitely, but we're moving towards a track where there will have to be a serious consideration given to coaching regime change at that point. Because nice. New Zealand can't go to World Cup with you know if Ireland win this series, even if Ireland win one test and do so in a manner that shuts New Zealand down, where, where Barrett's just a shadow, not able to get into the game, and they can't get anything going, as has been the way in the past, that will probably be enough for, for everyone in New Zealand to say, well, that's too big a risk to send this coaching group to the World Cup next year, because if Ireland do that in a quarterfinal, you know, we're out, and we know that now, so we're going to have to change that up. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. So not only are Ireland going on one of the toughest summer tours you can do as as a test side, they're also going to a country that is going through a bit of a, an identity, not an identity crisis, but are trying to find their identity, are, have a coaching ticket that need to prove themselves, a group of players that need to prove themselves, and are just hoping to crush anybody who uh, tries to get out of the Lars's roar of them. I think you've nailed that beautifully. That's exactly what's going to have to happen here. And look, it's not just about the coaching team. There's a few there's a few players that need to prove that they're still able to do that because we haven't seen the best of for, for various reasons injuries been in Japan but Brody Retallick hasn't been Brody Retallick as you as we all know him um, for quite a while now so he's up against a very good uh, uh, group of Irish locks I think you could pick any of them and they'll be pretty challenging so. You know, we we need to see him get back to to fighting these guys to the point where he looks dominant. Sam Whitelock, look, he had a brilliant Super Rugby final with his with his aerial work, and he he is a great aerial forward. But you know, when the, when New Zealand went to the Northern Hemisphere last year, the French and Irish locks were really dynamic around the field. They had a change of pace when they hit the ball. They were they were sneaking turnovers. They were making tackles like they were loose forwards. There was a they look more athletic and more dynamic than Sam. So there's a question mark there. Can he can he come up to the level of you know a James Ryan or an Ian Henderson or whoever is going to be playing for Ireland? 
and ditto the front row because that's where Ireland really had them and France had them the following week. Front rowers were getting off the deck quickly, passing and catching, hitting things hard. New Zealand looked very uh, undynamic in that area. Props that could scrum, but not much else. So these these are the questions that, that we have. It's not just about the coaching team. There's a handful of players that, that need to prove that they can that they can not only play at this level still, but that they can get better between now and the World Cup. It's very high stakes, Matt. Um, from Ireland's perspective, what do you think is a break-even or a good tour or something that we can um, take positives from? Do we need to win at least one game here or is there a world in which you can actually lose all the games, play really well, uncover some new talent and some new patterns of play and think, OK, that's grand, we've learned a lot from this. Is it is it just about results at this stage for this Ireland setup, And that includes the players and the coaching ticket. Always about results. Never anything else, mate. It's, don't go about it. But it's just, just one before we go to Ireland. you got to understand what Gregor says is 100% true. It's been like that for 100 years. Like, if you go to New Zealand rugby, you lose two games in a row in New Zealand rugby, you're in crisis. The country's in crisis. They are ruthless with their coaches and with their players, and they have always ha- have been. You know, you go, you talk to the great Grant Fox, who Joe is taking over from. Talk about the ruthlessness and the pressure that was put on those players back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. That is what drives New Zealand rugby. It is the most ruthless place on the planet to be a rugby player or a rugby coach. You, you have a bad month and you are in serious trouble and you are ripped apart. And that comes back to what Greg is saying about pressure on Joe. Do you really want that? Does that come back to Ireland? Ireland is a very different rugby environment to what New Zealand is, as is most places around the world. Ireland are going to the hardest place on the planet to play a team who are desperate to prove themselves. You've just heard what Gregor said. And they, they had a COVID year last year. And we've got to, let's be fair, the New Zealanders and the, and the Argentinians were in a bubble for months. Now, that biosecurity bubble we know uh, from rugby league in Australia had massive um, uh, mental health issues with the players. You, you, you're not in a bubble. You, you're, you're in a, you're sensory uh, de- deprivated. You're away from your family. You can't go out. You can't go to socialise in the community. You can't go to the beach. You can't do anything. You've got to stay in your hotel and you're in. And that's what they had to do. By the end of the November season, New Zealand were fried. So they're a very, very different opponent. The, the tour, the way it's structured, I, I said, when I first heard of the, the structure of the tour last year, I said, one test is a great tour for New Zealand. One test win is a great a great uh, tour. They, they've beaten England in Twickenham. They went toe-to-toe with the best team in the world at the moment, which is France, in my opinion, and they lost, but they went toe-to-toe because... This team radically changed from Joe Schmidt's game plan last November. And not being disrespectful to Joe, that's just a fact. We all saw it. They're playing a more New Zealand type of game. They are running the ball and they've been highly efficient. They've taken a a mirror image of what Lens to do and they've put it into the national side to get a national philosophy from bottom to top, just like New Zealand do. It's brilliant. You go to New Zealand, you win any test, that is a great tour. That's a great tour. Australia, Australia haven't done it for many, many, many years and we play them three times a year. Now, what will look good there? Any win will look good. The midweekers are still going to be hard. Now, the, the Maori have picked young guys, but they are highly talented young men playing for their future, trying to get a toe into the national team. And that national team is desperate. The first test is where New Zealand are, of a series, is where New Zealand are always vulnerable. Not weak, but vulnerable. And what did the New Zealanders do? They put it at Eden Park. <laughs> well, they haven't lost a game in 44 games since uh, France beat them in 1994. So the New Zealanders know they want they want a clean slate. So it is possible for Ireland. It, it, the, the, the odds are saying Ireland won't win a game. That's the odds. That's and that's history. So if Ireland can win something, that's a great test. If you can go toe to toe with New Zealand and lose, that's still a positive. What you don't want is what New Zealand are capable of. You should stick with them for an hour and the last 20 they run in four tries. So it's 50 to 50 to 15 or something. That's not a good tour. So there's a whole lot of ways Ireland have got to look at this. But the the the, the money, if you've got any money, you put it on New Zealand. And anything that comes out beyond that for Ireland, I think is a plus. Okay. So you don't actually think we're going to win a, a, a test over the three? I think Ireland, are, this is a very good Irish side. They're very well coached. They're capable of winning a test. Absolutely, they are capable of winning a test. I'm not suggesting that 
at all. I, I, the, I, don't, I think this Irish team can win. And I think that the odds were the first test was their best bet. The fact that they've been moved to Eden Park has moved it. They can win, but the odds are saying they won't. But I, I certainly believe they can. And look, it might it might change. They might get a better shot at the second test. You know, Dunedin or, or Wellington might be a better shot for them than uh, than Eden Park has been has been for everyone else since 1993. But we've we've got to say that this this isn't a, an Irish side that's going there with no form or no chance. They're psychologically shot. That's not the case. This is a very good Irish side. They've had a lot of success against New Zealand in recent years. And this, but this challenge that they are facing is different. It's not Chicago. It's not. It's not November in Dublin. This is New Zealand when New Zealand are angry and primed, and that is a very, very different uh, animal you're taking on. It's funny, Gregor, listening to Matt. Like I, I think that's generally how most Irish rugby fans feel. If we were to get one win from this, we'd be absolutely thrilled. Whereas what you're talking about is the the, the state of crisis that has enfolded the management team and. Uh, and so the stakes are so high for that group like New Zealand are 12 point favourites with the Irish bookmakers I don't know what the, the prices are they must be fairly similar um, uh, down under as well and that's kind of our expectation is that New Zealand are nearly two tries better than Ireland in Eden Park on Saturday morning our time when the game kicks off is the expectation still from you and your colleagues that New Zealand notwithstanding all the trouble they will still win these games I don't know if they will. Yeah, look, like probably I would go into the, this series exactly what Matt just said there. Like to, it takes a phenomenal, and Ireland know this, you know, because they had so many times at getting close to beating Ireland before they actually did it. Like you, they're, they're a cockroach of a team. They're really difficult to put away anywhere in the world, wherever you encounter them, even if they're at the end of a 15 week isolated, um, ISO bubble tour in Dublin in November. I mean, you've got to remember, even though it looked like Ireland won that game quite easily back in November, you know, one forward pass between the Ioanni brothers and they would have scored and they would have been the least deserving winners ever, but they probably would have won that game if that pass hadn't been called forward. And and that's who they are. They've got this ability to survive um, and they're, they're angry, they're desperate, they're playing at a ground they haven't lost at for, you know, 100 years or whatever ridiculous number it is. So, so to beat New Zealand, you, you you have to play 84, 85 minutes of your best game ever. You know, it's got to be the the best that Ireland have got. They've got to get to that level and sustain it from minute one to minute whenever the referee finally blows the whistle. And that's a huge ask. You know, it, it takes a lot of things to go right for them because you're playing a team that even if they're off, off where they need to be, as we saw in Dublin, you know, one bit of Will George magic, he scores a try. One bit of Rico Ioanni magic, they nearly score another try. And that's who they are. So, look, there's also sense with the All Blacks that they, that, they, that they go into a game, even no matter what history tells you, recent history, no matter what their form might look like, no matter what the crisis might be at the moment with the management team, when they name the 15 or the 23 guys that they're going to put on the park this Saturday, everybody will be looking going... Wow, wow, uh, uh, you know, all this, all the anxiety, but you're still listing guys, Bowden Barrett in the form of his life, Aaron Smith, still a world-class number nine, Ioanni playing better than he ever has in the midfield. They, they'll probably have, um, I don't know whether it's going to be Fanganuku or Caleb Clark on the left wing, but there'll be someone causing a bit of havoc out there for them. So when you're Ireland, you're looking at that going, you know, this is a team in crisis. And look, look at the 23 guys that they got yeah. on that bit of paper. Yeah, uh, and um, you know you got to be realistic about what it takes. As Matt says, to even to live with them for sixty minutes is a good, good. Yeah, you know, that's a good thing to be able to do. But you know they'll they'll go up another gear on Saturday in the final twenty, and, and there's a big ask of Ireland. Can you find another gear and live with them? And you know you might be fifteen twelve after sixty minutes. Uh, New Zealand have got a habit of turning fifteen twelve into thirty nine twelve, forty three twelve. And and it looks pretty bad at the end for Ireland. What what might happen here? So, it, look, Ireland are good enough to win a game, but everything has to align for them to do that. And all the kind of emotional anger and frustration that's in the New Zealand system at the moment, you suspect that they're pretty good at finding a way to to make that quite powerful for them, um, and and quite a big energy that they're going to take into the game. And look, I, I'm not. I, I'd be surprised if it doesn't end up three 0 to New Zealand in the end. Yeah, I think we all would be too happily surprised on, on our side. Uh, some breaking news from Key and Tracy of the Irish Independent tweeted 
12 minutes ago to say that Ian Henderson has damaged his knee with some significant uh, damage and has been, um, he's flying home. So he, he got injured in training and for now Andy Farrell is not going to call up a replacement which means that it looks like Ty Byrne is going to start alongside James Ryan. It'll be Byrne's first start since the Six Nations. Matt, that's, that's devastating because we don't have huge strength and depth in the second row at international quality and uh, the fact that Byrne has not played since the Six Nations, he would have been a perfect sub to bring on for the last 15, 20 minutes when things were in the melting pot and uh, now he's got to start the game. So you're just going down the depth chart a little bit and the depth chart is not particularly deep in the second row. No, it's not. No, you've got to feel for Henderson. He's had a wretched 10 months of injuries and I certainly hope it's not a interior cruciate and he's out for nine months but it doesn't sound good if he's been they're saying it's significant and he's been sent home that doesn't sound good look the plus of of bringing burn in is he is another back rower um he is very good in the line out so you've got a, you're obviously a line out option there but he is also exceptional around the field at the breakdown he's he's one of the best if not the best um uh, jackler in Irish rugby and if you are going to beat New Zealand you have to disrupt them at the at the breakdown when Australia play well against New Zealand uh, you know the, their back rowers Michael Hooper and so on are disrupting them they are slowing and they are stealing so there is a plus in uh, in burn coming in the question is you're going to go from not playing from the six nations to a pace of a game that will be absolutely electric. Like if you watch the final of Super Rugby last week, even though it was it was wet, like it was just at a pace that was unbelievable. And that is what New Zealand will try and do to Ireland. Put a pace on a game at international level that will that they won't live with for 80 minutes. And that's the point. You might live with it for 60, but can you live with it 80? So I would suggest your burn has got possibly an hour inning, and then they'll, they'll be going to do the bench. And it'll be very interesting to see who Ireland uh, put onto their bench as uh, as their uh, backup lock for uh, for that situation. Yeah, for sure. Matt Williams, Gregor Paul, great for your uh, your time this morning. Thanks very much. Gregor, just one last question. Do you expect the New Zealand Maori team tomorrow to beat our team? Is that the general consensus in New Zealand, or is that one kind of like almost a throwaway in, in some ways? That's, that, that's probably a bit of a bit of an unknown. That's a youngish looking Maori team. A few players I'm not actually that familiar with. Um, look, it, it, as long as it's entertaining, I think everyone will be quite happy to go down and watch it. But I, I, I'm not sure how that will go. Yeah. Truthfully, could, could be um, could be either way. All right. Okay. Good stuff, Matt Gregor. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Pleasure. It's uh, 8.41. There's a comment in here. Sexton shouldn't start a single test. It doesn't matter how good he is, says Pascal Jacob. He won't play four games in six weeks of the World Cup. Better for Carby and Byrne to get the time against the best. I think regardless of what way you look at it now, especially after listening to that conversation, this is going to be an unbelievable challenge for Ireland. So what do you do? Do you just lean into the challenge and go all out and say, let's make this uh, our World the Cup most final. chaotic possible uh, situation, which is a situation without Johnny Sexton? Well, so our... Or like, does he not play? He plays barely a minute in the World Cup. Play comes off the bench for three games and then starts the World Cup quarterfinal. I, I don't know. That's like that's a very very tricky one to like. I I, I don't know what you do there. I think that you have to have your starting ten who plays the big pool match against South Africa and plays. Um, the quarterfinal. I'm sure. I'm sure he'll come through unscathed against the South Africans. They won't. They won't target him. There'll be no cheap. Cheap shots there. I don't. I don't think you can have an out half that plays that is put aside for one game. That is destined to play one game. Right. You have to have your starting ten. Oh, you need a couple of starting tens. Maybe or, that's like, it. Like I mean, maybe Kieran Frawley is is the guy after tomorrow morning. Maybe.